in yeah okay yeah okay yeah how much uh, upload bandwidth do you have this is going to be a bit intense on you isn't it Testing. Okay, well, it's come up on uh, my YouTube subscriptions. So, hi everyone. Welcome to the live stream. Yeah, I keep saying you have connectivity issues, Jacob. You're still sharing your screen, right? Uh, yeah, I believe so. All yep. right. Yeah, I can still see what you're doing fine. That Yeah, that's making me think now. So what exactly is OBS syndicating? Does it lock onto this browser window or something like that? Um, right now, yeah, I've got a window capture for the browser window. Cool. But OBS could yeah. do a whole lot more. I, I guess if you want to start asking me questions or something, <laughs> all right, you prepare those. Uh, Uh, well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the first weekly composer chat. If you're joining us on the live stream, feel free to join the call is in the description of the live stream. Um, so, Chris, I'm not sure you sent me some information about sort of what you're planning for composer. Um, and I was hoping to talk a little bit about that, if that's OK to talk about. Yeah, yeah, perfect. We haven't actually put out that document publicly that you were referring right. to. Right. That was why so I wanted to ask. listening to this, it's, it's probably uh, but we pretty much are going to do it next week, so we can talk about that. Okay. Um, I mean, I can actually upload it now. So let, let me just really quickly upload it so we're not actually talking about something that people don't have access to. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll just post it on the phone. Hello there. This is going to be the... Oh, hi there. Hi. Right. Hi there, Jitsa. Okay, am I coming in good? You are, yeah. Um, what's your um, for a username or name? I'm just wondering if I know you. I probably should recognize you, but I'm terrible at that. OK, so I'm just uploading that document of ours to our forum. This is going to be the sloppiest announcement ever, <laughs> but I guess I'll provide some more details on it on it, on it later. Um, just find where I actually have it, somewhere in my Dropbox. Right. So basically, for anyone just joining us, um, Composer is a content management system that Chris here is the lead developer of. He's been developing it for over a decade. Um, and this document that he's talking about is a change of direction for the development of Composer. Yeah, so I'm uploading it. Which section of the form are you putting that in? Um, deploying, I probably shouldn't actually, I probably should, probably should put it in general, but I'm going to come back to this topic later. I'll put a link through to it. And I'll link 
to my topic, which I'm making back to this live chat in, any way, in case anyone's just... All right, looks like Chris is disconnect. Um, there he is. Uh, I think I'm back. I yep. accidentally uh, click, clicked away from the window there. Okay, I'm, I'm linking the topic I'm making back to this chat. So if anyone finds this topic and wonders what I mean when I'm saying we're talking about it, they'll be able to come through to here. So I uh, post a link in the chats. Okay, so now that that document is officially public, so All right. ask away or make, make whatever remarks about it you want. Yeah. Um, so I think it's pretty interesting what you are doing here. Basically, you've got your company OC Products that has largely been in charge of developing OC Portal for the past um, over ten years that you've been developing it. And now you're mm -hmm. looking to move to more of a community centric development model is is the general idea, right? That's it, yep. So um yeah, we had um are you aware of like the cathedral versus bizarre um dichotomy of development? It's this um famous dichotomy by one of the pioneers of open source where the bizarre is like it's a marketplace of um developers who are all kind of putting in their own ideas and contributing. Whilst Cathedral is more like it's a centrally planned development and a small team is building it out. They're taking in feedback from people, but feedback, uh, general people don't have direct ability to develop the product. It all goes through the central team. So traditionally, we've been more of a Cathedral development, which has helped us made a really well-organized system but we're looking to change it to a bizarre orientated development so that anyone can come along and make their own contributions. And previously, I didn't want to do it like this because I care really, I care a lot about making it a really well organized system, um, that's centrally designed and centrally planned and consistent and all that kind of thing. Because at least in the past, open source systems have tended to be, you know, a bit fragmented and messy. Um, but because we're so deep into our development now and because I want to actually bring in more ideas from different people, I think it's time to switch over. Um, so with a careful plan um, and with uh, good systems for testing and um, doing code review and so on, um, we plan to move over to bizarre orientated development and you know, encourage more people to get involved in the development rather than just uh, myself and my employees from OC products. Right. Um, and you've talked a little bit about how that's kind of out of necessity due to the changing nature of what your business is doing and the clients that you've got. Um, you know, you, yeah. you have been developing yeah. under a cathedral model for a long time now, and you have made a really high quality product that's got a lot of integrated features. Like you said, it's a lot more cohesive than other systems. Um, are you concerned at all about that? no longer being so cohesive um, if you do succeed in getting a lot more people involved in development or do you think there are ways that you can avoid that? Um, I'm a bit concerned in the sense that I know I'm going to have to put in a bigger effort to review code and make sure it's up to, up to standard. I can't just you know let loose and you know people put through their patches and they don't go reviewed and it just gets kind of piled up with a bit of a mess but I think with care, I don't think there'll be any kind of problem. Um, so my fault is, we, we have quite a large test set already, uh, automated testing. Uh, like if, if whenever we test set and it's just like 10,000 checks. Um, so I'm fairly confident that w when I see that someone's doing something wrong, we can, in most cases, add something to that test set to automatically detect it. If, if, if uh, other people do it wrong in the future to pick it up. Um, and realistically, there will be cases where like, design standards won't be properly met. So we've got 
So like, there are like 500 coding standards covering everything from how you write your English English text to how you write your code to just consistent ways to doing things and user interface conventions. And I, I certainly imagine that people will be adding new screens and they'll be you know, realizing there'll be some existing component to lay things out in a consistent way so they add a new component. Um, and realistically, that's that kind of thing. It's not always going to get picked up in reviews. But I think at this point, we kind of reached the tipping point where those kinds of problems are trivial compared to the innovation that will, that will be brought in by multiple con contributors. So we, we can you know, keep things consistent enough. And we have so much documentation, so many tests, so many written coding standards that it should still be better than the average open source is our developed project anyway. So there's no perfect solution for anything. I just think it would be at this point better. Oh, hello, someone new. Hi there, is that Bob? Looks like it is. Yes. Hi there. Um, hi. I can see you. I, I, it's a bit jerky, but hi there. Welcome to the. I don't think my audio is working. Oh, it is. We hear you. I think you don't have um, quite enough upload bandwidth. I think that's the problem. And I'm getting some feedback from someone. Um, someone um, using speaker rather than um, headphones. I see everyone wearing headphones. I see everyone wearing headphones. I can also hear myself, though. I can also hear myself. Oh, oh yeah, uh, Jason, I, I can see you've set your name now, and I know who you are. That's good. <laughs> All right, well, um, All right, well um, so it sounds like you are pretty confident about the cathedral like or the, um, the cathedral yeah, the new model, the community oriented model being overall good for the product. Um, another question I had that's not exactly about Composer, so maybe we don't want to talk too much about it, but it was just something I was curious about. One of the big changes for you, um, being the owner of OZ Products, and having developed Composer under OC product for so long, it's really interesting. You really focused on removing OC products from the new Composer website that you guys are working on. Um, just about all yeah, over. yeah, Jacob. Um, yeah, yeah, because we're getting so much feedback. Right yeah, um, I think we better fix this. <laughs> um, I'm just going to try muting you just in case it is somehow coming from your one. Yeah, that worked. Okay. Yep. Uh, Bob, so I've muted you because the feedback's coming from your machine somehow. Uh, I'm not sure if it's because the microphone's close to close to your headphones or if because you've got speakers on as well as the headphones or something. But I had to mute you because um, I was hearing everything I said coming back from your machine, and it's you know it's been like being caught in a tunnel. So uh, feel free to unmute yourself once you've resolved that. Uh, I see someone else. Is, oh, Rajesh, welcome back. Um, sorry, Jacob, uh, what were you saying? Um, yeah, um, so basically, please. even though Composer, the idea is that it won't uh, be as... Now I oh, uh, hi, Rajesh. Uh, I, I can't hear you now, Jacob. I didn't meet you, did I? Uh, can you hear me now? I can, yeah. All right, excellent. Um, right, so the idea is to make Composer less uh, dependent on OC products going forward. Um, I am curious, though, as you're still going to be with OC Products, do you think that removing OC Products from Composer is going to take a lot of exposure away from OC Products? Are you, or do you have, does OC Products have its own connections that aren't through Composer slash OC Portal? Um, historically, do most of your contacts come through that website, or do you, are you confident you'll be able to handle that company without this, this product being connected with it anymore? Okay, so that touches on quite a few different things there. Um, Composer doesn't really benefit from exposure from OC products. Right. Uh, OC products does benefit uh, from exposure from Composer. Um, 
it's a little complicated to answer because it, it's it's tied into the way the web development market is going now. So when when, when we started out, it was kind of the case that we might do a project for like two hundred dollars and we're doing it a day, and then like every day of the week we'd be doing a different project. Um, but nowadays it's more like we have a small number of clients where we do ongoing work for and we have maintenance agreements with those clients. So we don't actually really need new clients. So hmm. I'm not at all concerned about um, reducing the stream of new clients to OC products. Okay. Um, but also, like, if Composer does, any, anything that makes Composer do well will make my company do well and vice versa. So, you know, if, if we manage to increase the number of developers tenfold, then even, even if we've reduced the flow of people to OC products, for commercial projects by a third or two thirds, it's going to be made up in the difference in the speed of composer development. So I'm, I'm really not bothered about that. In fact, I, from a company point of view, I actually want to avoid doing small projects because for an established company, you just lose money trying to do them. Hmm. It's all right for like a freelancer to do lots of small projects, but um, frankly, like most people who don't have um, venture capital investments or aren't already an established business, they can't usually afford to pay for their projects from a company nowadays right. because the middle class have such, squeeze, such squeezed incomes and such limited savings. And because development is so expensive now, I mean, there's so much you have to think about when you launch a new web property now. Um, I don't, we don't really want that kind of project. And I know there are freelancers who do want that kind of project. So by taking OC products out of com uh, Compo uh, the Composer site, it's going to actually increase the incentivization for other people to get involved because everyone's going to be an equal on that site. Everyone will be listed on the, um, I think it's the partners page. Everyone's going to be listed as an equal. Um, OC products will be like a sponsor, but any anyone else who's a co-contributor can be listed as a sponsor too. So every everyone will be equal as, as they, if they contribute to the product they they'll be an equal on, on the partner page so okay um i think that's a more equitable it's a, it's a more equitable solution for everyone really so it makes sense from a business point of view it makes sense from a business point of view oh excuse me drinking this soda it's making me burp <laughs> um does so that make sense yeah, it does. Um, sort of along the same lines, I see you're planning on removing the sponsorship functionality from the tracker. Is that correct? Yeah, it's the same logic. So, I mean, usually, honestly, we lose money when, when we work on sponsored functionality. Because right. It usually takes like three times longer than the, than the hours we estimate. And the, the hourly rate on the tracker is basically the hourly rate of a normal salaried American programmer without any overhead. So <laughs> it usually costs us like three times as much to actually do it as we get in the sponsorship. But um, you did mention in the yeah. PowerPoint presentation, some one-on-one -on -one development sponsorship system that you were thinking about though. Yeah, so it, it, it wouldn't be changing massively. It would be the same, except it wouldn't automatically go through to OC products. You wouldn't we're going to get rid of the support credit system entirely, at least that's the plan. So there'd be no automatic way of paying for the sponsorship. It'll be more like a negotiation. And then any any developer, including myself, who wants to implement it, will have to negotiate with the people who want to sponsor it on an individual basis, which honestly will be a bit laborious. But I, I think, again, it's more equitable. So if someone else wants to come along and maybe they live in the Philippines or something and they don't need such a high salary, then I'm very happy for them to take the sponsorship and do a good job. And I think that's great. It's, it's incentivizing people to, pe people who are probably already contributing, it's incentivizing them to contribute more. All right. Um, Rajesh, Bob, Jason, anyone have questions about this? Are you following what we're talking about at all? Yeah, no real questions. Um, like I said, I've, I've been following Composer and OC Portal for quite a while. I'm a real big fan of it. Um, 
I really appreciate I think, it. Uh, the only the only thing that I've really not been a fan of with Composer is the way the theme process works. Having to uh, redo a theme going from every major point release. Uh, I know it yeah, was yeah. It was talked about adding theme settings, additional theme settings for themes. I think that's a really good idea. That would uh, really allow yeah yeah changing up themes. Uh, sorry, sorry, Jason. Don't let me cut you off. Keep going. Yeah, there's uh, one thing that I did with uh, a software uh, about uh, maybe 15 years ago where it'd create a theme and then there'd be settings that would allow the rearranging of things on the on the screen. I think if we could get something like that into some of the default composer themes to where we could uh, change like the position of the banner um uh, maybe move the the navigation bar to different positions um, uh -huh. yeah even just radically moving things around like the panels i think uh that would eliminate a lot of the need for creating completely separate themes and people could just stick with the default theme and that would allow people to go from version to version without having to completely redo everything it's yeah. something that's been on my so that's pretty much on my list to mm -hmm. give it a try. Mm -hmm. Michael, cool. uh, that's pretty much the plan for. Um, sorry, I, I'll just say quickly. So it's pretty much the plan for version ten, or possibly going from ten and into eleven two to. Uh, sorry, for version eleven and going to version twelve. I can't keep track of all these versions. <laughs> uh, to to implement theme settings, so we have implemented quite a few theme settings already, and we're going to implement some more. Um, and you just mentioned too the positioning of the banner and moving the menu around. That those aren't theme settings yet, but I think that's interesting. I think we could do that too. Um, and some of the other ones would be like turning off shadows or turning off curved borders. Uh, and I, I completely agree with the kind of philosophy of what you said that it's a lot of work making and maintaining your own theme, and a large proportion of people simply want to have something that looks a bit custom. They don't need to maintain a completely unique theme. So if we can serve a high percentage of the users just with a few settings and remove that massive tax of making and maintaining themes, then I think that's a huge win. I completely agree. All right. Uh, I think I, I cut you off a bit, Jason. Did you, did you want to continue on with what you were saying? I think uh, one other thing kind of go along with that, like you said, is themes are separated into uh, templates and CSS, basically. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff in the CSS. I think that's really one of the real sticking points with upgrading themes, because a lot of that stuff can change from version to version. Uh, that would be yeah. another place where if we could put theme settings that would allow us to adjust things like color, even like if we do like seed color mm -hmm. without having to create a completely new theme or um, mm -hmm. font size, font color, font uh, type, and do all that from within a, a setting interface instead of actually editing the CSS ourselves. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what kind of uh, performance hit that would be to try to add these kinds of settings directly to the CSS? No, it wouldn't be because it's cached. So um, it, it would simply regenerate the cached theme or when you edit the settings. So it's not an issue there. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. Um, it's certainly been a problem. Like if we do some trivial style change to maybe fix a layout bug and then everyone has to copy over that change to their custom themes, it's 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 been a really difficult problem to solve so by eliminating people wanting to even wanting to customize their css we kind of sidestep that problem in in the past i've had ideas about trying to automatically copy through changes made onto the default theme through to people's custom themes 
and I had some quite sophisticated ideas about how to do it, but ultimately I think it would break like 20% of the time. And having a magical process that works 80% of the time and breaks 20% of the time is probably worse than making people do things manually. So I don't think we can sidestep the issue that the CSS is constantly going to be changing. But if we sidestep the desire to change the CSS, that, that solves the problem pretty well. Another idea I've been having recently, I can't remember if ideas I have nowadays are ideas I've come up with, or if ideas users have come up with, or new ideas, because there's so many things on the tracker. There's like a thousand tracker issues open at this point. I can't keep track of it all in my head. But um, at least some, something I've been thinking about recently is the idea of um, tagging theme capabilities. So if someone downloads and installs a theme someone's made, that theme would list what capabilities it has. So for example, it might not be an admin theme, it might not support people. Um, or it might not support the theme wizard, or it might not be optimized for print style sheets. Um, and that's another way of kind of sidestepping some of these issues. So if we make some style change to the default theme and that's resolving a bug in the admin zone or improving an admin interface, then it doesn't really matter if um, a user is using a custom theme that's tagged not even to support the admin zone. They don't then need to copy that fix through because they're not using that theme on the admin zone. So that reduces the, um, the problem a bit too. With, with theming, I just find that because there's no overall perfect solution to everything, it's just a matter of kind of chipping away at the problem from different angles. So we can improve the documentation, we can encourage people to make more themes, we can improve the theming tools, um, we can make it so people don't want to make themes at all. Um, and by chipping it away, chipping away at it from all these different angles, we make it more manageable. I think for something like WordPress, the themes are so incredibly simple because it's just, it's theming a blog and nothing else. They don't really have this problem. Or if they do have the problem, because the themes are so simple, they have. Um, so I'm getting, some, I'm getting some feedback. Uh, I'm sorry, Bob. I'm going to have to mute you again. Um, hang on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bob, I'm. I'm not sure. If, I'm not sure if maybe you have the sound coming out of your speaker rather than the headphones or something like that. Um, but. Uh, I had to mute you again so that it doesn't cause feedback when I talk. Um, uh, where was I? <laughs> Jacob, what was I talking about? You were talking about um, you had an idea to, to... You were talking about the WordPress themes being simple because it's just a blog compared to Composer, which yeah. is much more. Yeah, okay, so yeah. So, so sometimes uh, things speed up <clears> each other, so... Because WordPress is simpler, it's a theme for us. there are a lot more themes. And because there are a lot more themes, people don't even need to theme it. So it's kind of like the tail tra chasing the uh, mouth. Is that an expression? <laughs> Something like that, anyway. Uh, OK, yeah. So any more questions about that? Or should we move on to something else? Oh, uh, one more thing to say, actually. So. Because Salman is um, currently completely overhauling the JavaScript code on our version 11 branch, um, and because we're going to do some CSS overhauling too, um, any kind of design stuff's kind of on hold right now, um, because I don't want to muck up what he's currently working on. Um, and I'm currently working on client projects, and I'm not actively working on version 11 until I finish that. Um, but probably in a few months' time, um, version 11 developments will ramp up really quickly and we'll get towards doing a release. And some of this stuff will get done in version 11 and some of it will get done in version 12. Excuse me, which hopefully won't be that much longer after version 11, but uh, I found it's impossible to predict release dates nowadays.
All right. Any other questions about theming? Guess. Apparently not. <laughs> All right. Um, well, now that we've moved on to talking about Composer um, as a product and specific features, I just came up with a couple of um, scenarios to throw at you, Chris, and anyone else who has experience with Composer just to see um, you know, how to accomplish certain things. These, if anyone else has questions, you feel free to jump in as well, because this stuff is not about Composer as a whole anymore. Um, so on my website, personally, I publish videos using Composer, using the news system. I've done a lot of uh, customization to optimize it for media instead of text-based entries, replacing the preview text with thumbnails and things like that. The next big feature I'm planning to add is the ability to navigate through a playlist from the player pages instead of having to go to the playlist screen. Um, and when I say player page, I mean the news entry page. And uh, when I say play this screen, I've got pages that just display all the videos in a given category. Um, so basically, if you're watching a video series that has five videos in it and you're on the player page for the second one, I'd like to add a box with links to the next and previous video from that category. I think I would know how to add just the next and previous video in general because I know that all of the news entries are numbered, but I'm not sure how to get the next and previous video in a specific secondary category. I was wondering if anyone had thoughts about how to possibly start accomplishing that. Well, <laughs> um, okay, I'll try, I'll try and address some of that. Um, first question is, is uh, have you considered using a, um, like a, a widget? Because there's quite a few video player widgets with playlists support out there, and basically you define some XML, and that goes in a URL, and then the widget will process that XML and uh, put out a really nice uh, player with playlists. Do you want to do it like that, or do you want to have your own custom HTML? Uh, well, right now I am using Video.js for my video player. I'm moving over to that. Right now about half the videos on my website are YouTube embeds, but I'm working through, and I've got about half of them switched over to Video.js um, with a new host that I've uploaded all my videos to. So if something like Video.js um, has a feature that could do that sort of thing, that would be, I guess that would be acceptable. I was wondering if there was a way to do it through Composer um, so that I don't have to go in and customize that. I haven't looked into, I'm not exactly sure. Are you talking about like a plugin for a video player like Video.js or when you say widget, are you talking about something else? Right, I uh, I think you created a bit of a false dichotomy. So I'm not saying that you'd have to manually create the playlists. I'm, I'm saying you could write some composer code to create the playlist for you. Um, so you'd use, I don't know anything about Video.js, but I'm going to assume it's like a widget that has a configuration, a JavaScript configuration. And one of them, one of the configuration options will be pointing to a playlist. Um, so what you could do is you could template composer to playlist URL, a uh, URL to a Compose a script that URL would include a parameter, which would be the ID of the particular news category. Um, the current video you're in is in. So, for example, if you're looking at a video called Example and it's in a um, news category called Foobar, then it would pass through a playlist URL that would include an ID that was the ID of the Foobar category. Um, and then we just have to do a bit of PHP coding to output a script um, that would essentially list all the videos in that particular news category. That said, that might be a bit advanced because it's PHP coding. For me, a little bit. It's yeah, something we've done in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's something we've done in the past for clients, that. Let's put that, that to one side. Um, how would we do it without that? Um, it might require PHP coding. So we're having to do a query to find all the IDs within a particular news category. I mean, we could do it using the main multi-content block, using a custom template set on that block, but it would 
be so complicated it would be easier just to write code okay fair enough uh so, sometimes we sometimes we have this i mean you can do pretty much anything with composer but uh sometimes it is easier just to write code than to tie yourself in knots trying to override templates and misuse them right um maybe maybe we can just write code now if you want <laughs> <laughs> um see here so we essentially would be embedding a block wouldn't we so you're already embedding a YouTube player I can't remember exactly how you did it I think you did it in the news entry screen template you embedded YouTube code in there um, not YouTube code video playing code in, in right so I've basically the news entry screen you can modify similarly to um, what are the what's the database system called? MySQL. No, um, sorry, uh, like the in Composer database. Let me see here. Um, catalogs. Code, it's similar maybe. to catalogs. Um, you can add in custom oh, fields. Yeah, yeah. So right now I've added a separate field for the video playing code so that I can that field displays above the title and everything, and then the rest of the news entry that's in the regular field for that displays um, in its normal position on the page. Mm -hmm. That's the only real modification okay, of so, the news entry screen. Okay, so I guess we're doing a different way to how you did video. So the news entry screen uh, page uh, template sorry, will know the ID, the primary ID of the cache of user in. So we could edit that template to call a block, and a block parameter would be the ID. And the block would be a custom block we write. So we can write some code now, if you, if you like, um, to do that. I'm just thinking, are we going to do that on my bean? Um, I'm not sure. Do you, do you have a test site there, Jacob? Uh, no. I probably should, given how much I tweak around with my site, but I do everything basically live. OK. I can set up a test site. So I'm in the middle of implementing working uh, Microsoft SQL Server support for uh, the next patch release of Composer, because um, one of our clients needs it. Okay. So I don't want to actually use my, my normal test site right now, because that is um, all configured for SQL Server. And I don't even have the database server running there right now. So I'm going to quickly reinstall my test site, and then I write a little block on it. Hmm. OK, so just bear with me. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about something else whilst I do. This is just going to take me five minutes. Sure. Um, yeah, one of my favorite things about Composer is that it does have those. It's got basically two what I consider programming languages. It's got temp code in it, and it's got um, com code, and which is more of a markup language. But the fact that temp code is there, that's one of the major selling features for me because I'm not a huge programmer. Um, I'm I know a little bit of PHP, but not a whole lot. Uh, but temp code is really intuitive and easy for me to wrap my head around, given how well it's documented on the Composer website. Uh, that's one of the reasons I try and do as much as I can in Composer. I have modified some blocks um, and made uh, a custom block or two here and there. But in general, I try and do everything that I can in Composer, also to make upgrades easier. Um, but yeah, I think it's really great how configurable everything is and how much you can tweak everything if you are willing to get a little bit into the coding without having to necessarily go full on rewriting the or changing the content management system itself. Um, so yeah, let's see. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I'm sharing my screen right now. Let me just share that again. OK. OK, so you should see my test site on my shared screen. Yeah. Is that working? Yes, it can, is. Can you see my test site? Cool. So ignore the ugly purple <laughs> theme. <laughs> it's just random. Uh, what am I doing here? So I'm, I'm, I'm going to add some news. So um, I'm so just going to add a couple of test news articles. All right. I, I guess um, I don't need to think about video at all, because all we really need to do is link to other articles in the same category, don't we? Right. So it's not necessarily a playlist, per se. It's more just uh, an embedded 
uh, list of links to other articles within the same category. Right. Uh, are you concerned at all about um, what happens when you've got 10,000 articles in the same category? Because um, obviously... Yeah, so layout-wise, with a block that's just going to the very next and very previous, um, I don't see why it would be different if there's four videos in a category or 400. Um, are you talking about performance-wise or...? Well, performance-wise and interface-wise, so if you have a playlist and the playlist is everything in a category and you've got 10,000 articles in a category, obviously we can't list them all. Right. Um, but it could be that your site's never going to have that many, in which case we don't need to worry about it. Yeah, I mean, I've already got sort of playlist pages that do have quite a few videos on some of them, um, and for that I just have a page that does list all the, the videos in a certain category. So listing everything in a uh, category I've already got that down. The um, the functionality I'm looking to implement would be just the previous and the very next in the category. That's why we don't need to list all of them. So interface-wise, it would be it's more so that you can get forward and backward without having to go back to that oh. playlist page every single time. Okay. Um, yeah, and just just saying that you made me realize actually the main multi-content block can actually already or the main news block can already be embedded in the news entry screen template to share everything in a category. Uh, it's just a matter of kind of passing through the parameters correctly to that block using temp code. Okay, okay so previous and next, you, you can't do previous and next currently, so we're going to have to write some custom code for that. And I guess we can make that a block. Um, I guess may maybe it would be best to make two blocks, one block for previous and one for next then you can uh, have those buttons anywhere you want. Right. And you can have something in the middle of it in your template. Because um, I want to assume that the HTML is going to have those two buttons right next to each other, which would have to be the case if it was a single block. Right. Um, OK, so I've added two articles to my default art category here. Um, so I guess we'll have a previous button to take us to test art one. And the next button on test art one to take us to test art two. So um, I'm going to start doing some coding. All right. Just bear with me when I get my edit when I get my editor open here. Okay. Okay. So we're going to make a mini block because that's easy. So in sources custom slash mini blocks, we'll make a new file called uh, news previous.php. And we'll have news next.php too. Oops. OK. And we're going to edit the news entry screen templates will have to be overridden to templates custom. And let's just do a test here. So if I put XXX under the title, and now we should see XXX. Yeah, we do. Cool. So we're going to include a block using temp code. Um, and that shouldn't actually show anything. I'm just testing that it doesn't actually crash and burn, and it doesn't. It is actually including the news previous block there. Right. And actually, we could just say like we could say hello in here, and I think it would say hello. Yeah. Um, mini blocks are incredibly simple. They're basically PHP includes. So this is actually HTML. I haven't even written any PHP. I could have also done. Oops. That. I'd work too. All right. And it does work cool. Okay, so we've got a block we've got a block hooked up. Now we need to pass through the category parameter to the block. Um and I don't actually know what the category parameter is. Um I'm just gonna look at the code. You you could um find out the category parameter using the um 
param info, temp care directive, which will dump all the um, parameters um, a template gets. But typically, I just find it quicker to look at the code. Here we go. News entry screen template is called, and it's given a category ID parameter. So we're going to pass through that as a parameter called cat to our block. Oops, to our block like that. And now, that should say our category. It's category seven. Uh, map is automatically defined. You don't need to worry about it. Um, again, many blocks are incredibly simple. Um, it's just PHP code with access to the full browser API, and dollars map is automatically defined for you, and it just contains all the parameters of the block. Hmm. Um, so now we actually need to write the code. Um, I should put that into a variable directly. Okay, so we need to find, we need to find the previous article within a category. OK, so I've forgotten something here. I've forgotten to pass through a parameter of the ID of the news entry, because if we're going to find the entry before it, we need to know what the ID of that entry, ID of that entry is. Right. So I call it, I call it us ID. And uh, I'm pretty sure the parameter name will be ID in the temp code. Actually, when I assign these to variables, I'm going to put it through int val because I want them to be integers, not strings. Uh, because when I query the database, I want to query based on the correct data type. Um, OK, so it should be a fairly simple query. So dollars previous ID, a variable called previous ID is equal to, we'll do a database call. Just rearrange my keyboard a bit here because I'm at an angle. Um, select the value if there. Okay, this is it's composer with composer. You don't usually have to write any SQL code. Um, the database API will write it for you. So we're querying a table called news, and we're trying to find the ID property on that table. And we are only querying when the category is cat ID. Um, I'd better just check that um, that's the correct name for that uh, database property. Uh, I'm just finding the code that creates the table. Okay, so creating the table news, and it's actually called news category. That's the link to the primary news category. Okay, so we're, when the news category is category that we pass to the block, we're going to get the ID. And we have to add, we could have to write a little bit of SQL here. And um, OK, so I'm going to write some code, then I'm going to change the code. Okay. I'll keep it simple at first. So when the ID is less than us ID, then that's going to be the previous one. Um, and because I've used if there, uh, query select value if there, it's actually going to return null if there's no previous ID in right. the table. So if, if it's the first news entry, then you're going to get null back. If I didn't have if there, at the, if I didn't have if there here, it would actually crash out with an error message yeah. if there wasn't one. Um, OK, and for now, I'm just going to echo out that value. So we can see what it is. That works. It's going to say hello again. One, well, just one. Okay. So, so this code works. Um, the reason I don't like doing this by ID is because technically we should be doing it based on dates, because it is possible to have a order news article with a higher ID number. If you, for example, use scheduled publishing, you might have a um, an older ID number with a newer publishing date because they're not correlated. Right. So it's gone into the database earlier. That yeah. Oh, oh, maybe you're doing some kind of import job, and you've imported a lot of news articles, and uh, 
they might be old news articles, but they'd have a new set of IDs. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do it based on dates. And I'm going to make my life easy now. I could, we, we could just pass in SID and look up the date of that article and the category of that article and then use that in our query. Um, but I'm just going to pass it into the block. So I'm just going to say us timestamp is. It's more efficient to do it like this too, because we already have the data. So we don't need to do another query to get it. We're just sending what the template has. Right. Um, so add date raw has the Unix timestamp. So do you know what a Unix timestamp is? It's a number of seconds since 1970. Okay. Um, that's how we store. That's how we store dates and times, just as a number of seconds since 1970. So we're going to pass that through as the best timestamp parameter. And if it's add date is the database field, and that has to be less than. Uh, first time stamp. I'm going to make an assumption that no two articles have the same time stamp. Okay. It's not very likely that you had two articles in, in the same second. Right. And mm -hmm. if you if you did, we'd have to sort by add date then ID, and it would complicate our code quite a bit. So let's just assume there's no two articles in the same time stamp. Yeah. Um. I think that's, that should work now. Oops, I think I probably got the field name wrong. I did, I got the field name wrong in the database. It's not add date. Um, let's go back up here. You don't have to check the code, by the way, just because I'm a programmer, I usually look at the code to find things out. But you could just look, look in um, PHP my admin or something to see what fields are in the table. Right. Uh, it's date, it's date and time, not add date. Um, just change it there, then it should work. Okay, cool. And we still got our ID. Okay, so now we've got. Let's actually generate. Have a hyperlink. So the hyperlink is going to have a label previous, and it's going to point to previous URL, which we're going to define. I'll explain all this in a sec. All right. Okay, so it's it's not entry; it's view. Um, okay, so we're defining a URL that includes the ID. Um, we're searching is so in the case of my test site, it's in the site zone. On your site, it's probably in the root zone. If you don't have, uh, if if you've got single public zone enabled, like most sites do, it'll be in the root zone. Right. Um, it's it's the news module or the news page. And it's the view type. So that corresponds to the URL. So site zone, news page, view type, and the ID. Um, you see in my URL here, it's the URL moniker. Uh, we're passing a numeric ID. But build URL will automatically apply URL monikers and URL schemes. So whatever URL scheme is configured, it will automatically put out a URL with that scheme. Right. And uh, it will autom automatically use the URL moniker, so the textual code rather than the. Um, so we put that URL into this previous URL uh, variable, and then we're outputting a hyperlink with uh, href of that URL uh, with a label of previous. 
and we're escaping it because technically we shouldn't output raw data into HTML. Um, for example, if there's an ampersand or something in the URL, technically we should have ampersand AMPs um, semicolon. Yeah. Um, just for it to validate. It's also a security hole because potentially um, people might um, be able to inject JavaScript code to through to the output if you don't escape variables you put into the output. Um, and technically, I don't have to do this, but I should evaluate it because temp code produces a uh, build URL produces a temp code object, um, and evaluate turns it back into a string. Okay. And we output the string. I don't. I don't actually need to do that because PHP will automatically evaluate it if you because it will automatically convert it to a string. Um, but I like to be explicit in the code I write. Mm-hmm. Just to make it clear, just to make it clearer, because I'm, I'm kind of of the view that if you let things automatically happen behind the scenes, it actually it might make things easier for you in the short term, but in the long run, you're not really understanding how things are working. Right. Um, okay, so I've made one mistake. Do you know what mistake I've made? I do not. Anybody else? You almost said it then. When you said "I do not," you almost said what the mistake was. Oh, um, something about the ID then. ID not. What if there's no ID? Yeah. So if the previous ID is null, then just return. That'll stop the block execution. So there'll be no link if the ID is null. Right. I.e., if there's no previous news news article. Okay. Um, we use a triple equals here because if we did a double equals, it uses um, non-strict type comparison. So if the ID was zero, it would actually pass this code ah. and return. So we have to say we have to say triple equals to make it check the data type and the data type value. Um, actually, in MySQL, you'll never get an ID of zero, but in some databases, I think SQL Server, you'll get ID starting from zero rather than one. Mm-hmm. So we should be a bit careful. Um, so that should work. Let's test it. And we click it, and it works. Great. Right. So we're almost done. We're almost done now. So we need to have the next button. Um, use next. Almost going to be a copy and paste job. Mm-hmm. Slightly sloppy of me because it's almost the same code, so I should write some little library. But the amount of code to declare the function to share the code would probably be more than the amount of code I'm copying and pasting. So yeah. uh, let's just let's just copy and paste it. Um, previous is now going to be next. And I already changed this, so it's not less than, it's more than. Um, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We're done. Wow. Wasn't really that hard, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I will send you this code. And uh, I guess I'll post the code on the forum. That would be great. Excellent. Thank you so much for doing that. That was really cool to watch. Mm-hmm. Anyone else have anything to... Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, me go ahead or someone yeah, else go ahead. It, it, you or anyone else. Sounded like you were going to say something. Oh, no. I, I was, no, no. I was just drinking my drink. Okay. Um, well, uh, is that someone else... Oh, okay. Um, yeah, do you have any more questions? We're halfway through, so there's plenty of time for questions. Jason, you have anything else? Any, any more little challenges? And no more questions here. Okay. Um, I had one other thing that was probably going to be simpler. Um, so yeah, another thing I'd like to do right now on my website, I've got a thing going called the Nerd Club where uh, people paying $3 a month on uh-huh. Patreon or Stripe can get access to some videos that the general public does not have access to. So of course for that, I'm just, I've created a news category 
and set the permissions so that only the people in the news uh, in the nerd club user group can view that news category. Um, so right now, if somebody who's not in that group gets a hold of that link to one of those videos, it will tell them they don't have permission to view the page. Um, I was looking mm -hmm. into changing that to actually say like join the nerd club to view this page. Uh, but just looking around quickly, I wasn't able to locate where either in the temp code or, or uh, I'm sorry, in the templates or in the language strings where that um, permission denied error actually is. Um, do you know off the top of your head where that would be? Awesome. Well, yes. So you could override, I think it's probably the um, worn screen template. Uh, however, there's a better way to do it. Um, there's something called match key error messages. Uh, which are now so I'm just gonna have to set up I'm gonna have to set up permissions quick on here so okay. let's say my art category can't be accessed by the test user so I'm gonna switch to the test user here and hopefully it can currently access it it can okay so I'm gonna change the permissions so that it can't um, okay so I go into the admin zone. Excuse me. Um, I'm just going to have two tabs here. So this this tab will be the admin view of the article, and this one will be the test users view of the article. Okay, so I'm going to edit the art news category and disable permissions for everyone. Except uh, allow super moderators and super members in. So super members, let's say that's analogy, analogous to your nerd club. Right. Okay. So if I refresh, I should get an access denied stream. Yep. Yeah, and it is a bit dry. So we we want a better screen than that. Uh, so security, match key page restrictions. So. Match key page restrictions are kind of complicated. It allows you to do URL level permissions. Okay. Um, so, for example, you can um, you could block access to view videos from the gallery module, but allow access to view images from the gallery module, which you can't do using normal permissions. But because the URL differs, you can do it based on match key permissions. Mm -hmm. um, however, there's a second feature linked to it called match key permission denied messages. Um, and that doesn't have to work via match key page restrictions. It can tie to normal permission permissions too. So if I do um, search news view, I'm trying to have to think what I'm doing here. View, not video. Okay, so any zone that contains a news module, and if the type parameter is view, then any error message triggered on there will have this. This is a really advanced feature, so I'm hoping this is actually going to work. <laughs> it's not something I use a lot. Let's try it out. It works, cool. All right. And I'll just double check it doesn't. It doesn't happen for admin. Yeah. So if an error message is triggered. And that error message matches one of these, or in our case, this, because we've only got one. Right. It will output this. And I'm not sure if this supports HTML or not, or temp code. Um, let's try making it bold. It might be com code. I honestly can't remember. Let's try com code. There we go. It's comp code. Awesome. Um, yeah, so that's pretty straightforward, really. Once yeah. you know how it works, um, you can customize any error message in the system. The only downside of this is it can't differentiate based on what the error message is. Sorry, right. differentiate based on what the permission denied message. It won't happen for every error message. It's only for permission denied messages. So if you had a permission denied based on category, then it will show that error. If there was some other permission denied screen, like based on page access or something, it will show the same 
error message. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's usually not an issue. Right. I mean, from your point of view, usually it's just it's, it's either denied or it's not denied, and there's only going to be one reason. Right. So it usually works pretty well. All right. Yeah. So. Yeah, I knew there must be some way to do that. Um, yeah, I didn't know about that match key permission denied messages feature. There are just so many little things in Composer. Hard to keep track of them all. Mm-hmm. All mm-hmm. right, cool. Um, Rajesh, you've been pretty quiet this entire well, time. What? Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Chris, you can go. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I was just going to talk about version 10.1. Okay. Um, so cur- currently we're maintaining version 8, version 9, version 10. Yeah. 10.1 beta, and 11 is in development. So that's, what, is that 5? Yeah, 5, five version. I'm actually trying to decide if anyone actually cares about version 10.1 at this point because it's a pretty cool release with um, e- e-commerce being completely overhauled mm-hmm. and it does implement one of the most popular uh, requests in the past which is um, ability to add little messages to the top of your site um, yeah, like, the, um... Um... yeah so for, for example we could on combo.sr say a little message that lasts for one day and it comes on on a certain day and ends on the next day and it says uh, um, join the uh, video chat uh, and this is the URL. Um, previously you had to edit a template or something to do that and now in 10.1 there's a little feature where you can configure it which is cool. Um, but I don't think anyone's really using it right now <laughs> and I don't really want to maintain a version that uh, no one has much of an incentive to upgrade to. And I'm kind of surprised because it does have some really awesome features. But I guess not a lot of people at the moment really want to make an e-commerce site. Um, so I guess, does anyone have any objections if we just uh, put version 10.1 on ice and leave it on permanent beta and just focus on pulling out that functionality with version 11? just to reduce the amount of maintenance we're doing. Personally, I was looking forward to that site-wide uh, message feature. I would understand if you moved that over to version 11 if that's a, a relatively major thing. But um, yeah, I think part of the reason people haven't upgraded to it might be, like you said, there are a few different branches um, ahead of the current version even that are being worked on. And I personally, I was using Composer in beta as long as it was only in beta. And then when it got stable, I've only upgraded to stable versions. Um, a lot of people are probably in that boat. Yeah. They just don't want to upgrade to something marked beta on a production website. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyone else have thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, in, in, in the past we've had loads of people just testing new betas like mad. Um, but I, I think I just figure that because no one particularly wants to build a e-commerce site, I mean, the people who are obsessed with testing, that it hasn't gone through that. Yeah. That's, that's actually what, one reason I'm slightly nervous about it, because as far as I know, no one's been beta testing it except us. Mm. <laughs> um, but that's really unusual. I, I don't think there's ever been a release we've done where the users haven't heavily beta tested it in advance of it being released. So I don't want to release something that might be full of bugs and I don't realize it. Right. That said, we do have one customer using it and his, customer, his site's working well. Okay. So it might be very stable. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking given that I'm not seeing huge objections here, maybe I can just check in a... Um, feature to do um, custom site messages uh, on version 10. So let's do that now. Let's say we want to show custom site message at the top. Um, It won't be quite as elegant as how it's done in version 10.1, but it'll be elegant enough. So um, being a global template, This is going to take me literally like five minutes. Okay. Um, so messages top is, yeah, that's where the standard messages come out. And we just put a new message here. Um, okay. 
think they go for the message template, they do, yeah. Okay, and that takes a parameter type and a parameter message. So let's just hard code one for now. Include message. This is quite a nice little tutorial, actually. Um, so I'm showing you how you can include a template that wasn't actually designed to be hand included, but it works. OK. Um, type, I think, in form should work. So if I'm right, then that should include a little message at the top that says hello in our standard templating, and it does. That was pretty easy. Now, you still have to edit the template because you have to set hello. So let's make it work by the database. So value option. So this is, this is a temp code symbol called value option. And we're going to pull in a value option called site message. And I wrap the whole thing. If start, if not, if none, empty site message. OK, so if, if site message is set, basically, it will out site message. So if I refresh now, it's not set, so we shouldn't see anything. No. Uh, but if I go into Commander and do set value site message test, cross my fingers, and doesn't work. OK. <laughs> I've done something wrong. Um, the code for the value option symbol. Yeah, because my other example went so smoothly, it's not very surprising my simpler example <laughs> failed. <laughs> Murphy's Law. Um, OK, so. Totally hacking the code to, to work out what's going on now. That's weird. Oh, I think I know what's wrong. I think it's. Uh, Composer is being too smart here. I think it's pre comprising the template. Yeah. Hmm, that's an interesting challenge. So we actually are pre including the value option symbol into the template when it gets compiled. So it's not actually dynamic here. Um, because usually a um, option like this, it would never change in the lifetime of the template. Right. Um, I think how I'm going to work around this. Temp code engine that powers temp code is incredibly complicated because it's optimized to the bone. Yeah. It's actually a PHP code. When you're coding a template, it ends up as PHP code and it runs it. Um, and this is the compiler that converts the temp code language into PHP. And it does all kinds of crazy optimizations. OK. I think I know how I can fudge this, make it work. Let's just super hack this, but see if this works. Problem is, I'm, I'm trying to make it. I think it's dynamic. 
so that everyone can pile it out. Hmm. Um, um, does someone else want to talk about something whilst I debug this? Because uh, it's going to be a bit boring. Yeah, sure. Um, so Rajesh, you've been included in the emails that me and Chris have been exchanging. What's your role at Composer? Uh, actually, uh, I, I coordinate with uh, the customers and uh, uh, also with the, the community members who, who are interested in Composer. Uh, I, I don't know much about the coding. Uh, I, I just uh, in uh, the promotional activities, uh, participating uh, in the forum and uh, doing the tutorial video in the YouTube uh, channel. So the, all those tutorial videos are posted in the Composer. YouTube channel are being done by me and uh, Manoj. Okay. So, so, so those are the things actually I do on Parfal Composer. Hmm. So that is the reason why when Chris has been uh, uh, editing the code, uh, I do not have any clue what actually he's doing, <laughs> right. but it looks good though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Um, with PHP code, I do a little bit of, I, I, I can edit code that's already been written, but doing things from scratch is a little bit above what I know. Um, I've talked a little bit about how I'm using Composer for my video website. Um, Rajesh and or Jason, how yes. do you guys use Composer? Uh, I actually, I'm learning Composer. I used to uh, test Composer running it in a local web server, and uh, I've been exploring the functionalities. Uh, uh, like the forum and the document uh, management, uh, the upload and download feature. And also now I have started experimenting the theme, which as uh, Jason has said, uh, that uh, the theme which has to be uh, really looked into. So I'm just trying to uh, learn much about theming so that uh, I may also contribute uh, something refreshing for the community members to use. Hmm. Yeah, so Rajesh actually has made quite a few theming tutorials. So it's not that he doesn't know about theming, but he, what he doesn't really know about is like CSS coding. Okay. So, um, yeah. Um, anyway, I've fixed uh, fixed my little bug by a super hack. All so right. the, the, the problem I had was um, temp code tries really hard to be efficient because Composer uh, processes so many templates. It tries to um optimize out anything that's static yeah and because any kind of option is usually usually static and you'd empty the caches after setting that option um it would just optimize it out i guess i could have said that in um commander that you could just empty the caches manually but i don't like to empty the caches unnecessarily so i've pushed this option so that includes um a set command in the temp code it's setting a variable it's not even doing anything with it, but because it's dynamic, that will just trick the optimizer into um, making sure that value option is dynamic. Okay. And it works. So, so if I set this to test four, and I refresh, and there we go, it works. Very simple. Cool. Well, you have to use commander to set. You have to use commander to set it, but as long right. as you know the code, it's very simple. Yeah. I guess I could add concurs for actually. It's a nice little thing. So if I do test in bold with com go, it's going to show the raw com code right now. But if I very simply just wrap this with com code symbol, now it's hard to see, but that is actually bold. <laughs> OK. Uh, maybe it would be easier if I uh, make it italics. Yeah, so now we have a composer about too. Cool. Just by uh, putting a few li few lines into our global template. Um, I guess we can make it even smarter. We could make it have a uh, activation date if we wanted to. Um, let me think how I'd do that. Um, yeah, so there's a way to get the current time temp code. Can't quite remember offhand what it is. Um, oh, I think just from timestamp. 
with no parameters. So if I just do this, uh, I think that'll dump our timestamp into it. Yeah. So now that we know how to get a current timestamp, we can just do a comparison with something in the database. So if we say uh, site message timestamp, we say uh, to time of the date today is the uh, 18th. So let's say the 17th of November. Okay, so that's actually, that would have stored the timestamp for the 17th of November at probably midnight. So if this value is greater than the current timestamp, then we should show our message. We can, we can do that really easily in temp code. So if greater than um, the value option of that from timestamp, That work. Oh, apparently not. I have to think about this. If the config option you've set is, oh, it actually should be less than. If the option you've set, the timestamp you've set, is less than, the, then that means that uh, it's passed. It's in the future from that. Therefore, it should show the message. Yeah, and just to prove this, this is actually doing what we want. Let's set it to the 21st of November. On it. <laughs> uh, I, I think probably at the same bug as I had before. Uh, not showing. This is 22nd, it should still not show. And let's put it back to the 17th. And it should. Ah, yeah, that wasn't too bad. If you don't understand temp code, this probably looks like a complete nightmare. <laughs> but once you understand the temp code syntax, it's not too bad. Right. Forgetting my ter terrible super hat which does make it a bit more confusing. Um, but really, it's just got nested, um, nested stuff. So maybe I can do a little temp code tutorial now. So start if one. Hello there. That should show hello there, because one is equivalent to true. Yeah, zero. It should not show. Yep. And then I can just add in logic. So instead of the literal number zero, I can do something like um, equals a a. Because a does equal a, it should say hello there. And it does. But if, if I do a b, if uh, a equals b, it shouldn't show it because it's not true. Yeah. And then obviously you can. Instead of having literal letters there, you actually set it to some kind of data source or some kind of temp code parameter, some kind of template parameter. So you do it live data rather. And you can just nest stuff. So if A is equal to A, then you can have an and. So if and. A is equal to A. B is equal to B, C is equal to C. This one's all true, so if, if you add three true things together, it's, it's true, right? Right. It is true that A equals A, and, and B equals B, and C equals C. So it should actually show it, yeah. But if we just change any any one of them, see like that, it should not be true. Yeah. Yeah, so temp code, it's, uh, as I said earlier, it compiles to PHP. But 
long as you have some basic understanding of like math, then it's a bit like writing math. It's mm -hmm. fairly easy. You just gotta you gotta understand how it's nested together. So you've got these commas that separate parameters, and then you kind of nest things inside as parameters. And that's how temp code works. Hey, okay. anyone else got any more questions for me? No, no more problems to solve in your site, Jess, uh, Jacob. I don't have anything. So I'm confusing else Jacob and Jason. Week. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I could try and talk about something else. Uh, let me think. All right. What other things are we? Jason, so, what do okay, you... Okay, so... Oh, go ahead. What, say, look, what are the biggest challenges with uh, doing a composer site? So, in my mind, theming... Uh, Jacob, did you hear that? Because it was just saying that you were losing. No, I did not. Could you repeat that? You still there? Can you still hear me? I am still here. Okay, it's. Uh, I think you're probably probably your upload bandwidth is such. Do that. Uh, I was just saying that I think the three biggest challenges with. Um, as a site or really any CMS site, it's theming, upgrading, and doing your layout of your blocks. Okay. Um, does everyone agree, or are there ever you know, big challenges that we want to try and make easier? So you said upgrading, theming, and block layout. Block layout. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the biggest things I've found myself spending time doing is, um, yeah, really customizing block layout, um, sometimes pulling things out of each other that are nested by default so that I can display them differently. Um, for instance, on my website, I've got a sidebar that has a separate background color from the main part of the website. And to do that, I believe I had to um, kind of redo the way that the sidebar displayed because the way that it displayed by default was nested within the same piece of content that the that the body was nested within, but I had to kind of pull it out to be able to set it its own background color. Um, another same yeah. sort of thing with the the um, news pages was I had to make that new field in the the news catalog for the video player because otherwise there was no way to separate out the video from the description and display the video above the title and the description below. Um, so sort of pulling things mm -hmm. apart from each other that are kind of stuck together by default is something I had to do a couple of times that falls under block layout. Um, yeah, yeah. So I I always uh, Microsoft front page, and maybe I'm a bit older than you, and uh, you've never used Microsoft front page. I don't know, maybe you have. Um, but back back in the day when I was uh, like 16, that's how people were making websites if they weren't programmers, and yeah. um, it was just for making static websites. Basically, you, you could put hit counter on there or something, um, but otherwise it was pretty much for making static websites. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit like using Microsoft Word or something. You just kind of do it all visually using WYSIWYG, so you'd be able to you could have like a panel and you could like make it wide, click around. And set, background colors and that kind of thing and it would be really intuitive and I've always wanted to get composer back to the point where it's as easy to do layout changing styles as it was in Microsoft front page because I, I really feel we've regressed hmm. uh, as, as an industry the web design industry it's got a lot harder yeah to do basic things but at the same time um, we expect a lot more from websites now so whilst some of the basic things we used to do were easier, there are things that are now basic that could never have been that easy. Right. The, the things of, but like, like setting shadows or something. Um, I, I suppose you could have it so that you click around and you like set the properties on a, on a block or something and you set a shadow, but it's not quite as intuitive as um, like dragging stuff around to size it would be. Um, 
And the other thing is that we, we now expect incredibly dynamic websites with um, content managed data and things are really contextual. Right. Um, so to do that, we have to share templates and we have to have like a, a hierarchy, a tree structure of um, templates. And um, therefore, if you're saying something in, in the layout of one screen, it's naturally going to affect something on another screen because it's sharing that same layout code. Yeah. And whether you actually want it to affect something else or not would really depend on what you're trying to achieve. So for example, if you have, um, let's say you're embedding the poll onto your panel and on one particular screen, you want it to have a bigger font, but on another screen, you want it to not have a bigger font. Or um, let's say you want to rearrange the order of blocks on your panel um, so that the poll's at the top, but you only want to do that on one screen. Mm -hmm. Uh, or you want to add another block on, you want to switch out one block for another block on just one screen. To actually be able to do that in a visual tool like Microsoft front page, it's not really practical. So, because it's not, there's no direct visual representation of a page anymore. There's right. no way you can actually have that because there's no, there's no such thing. It's all dynamic. Um, but ultimately, wherever possible, I want to make things point and click. It, it just kind of saddened me that you have to like read a book, a really thick hmm. book now, like that yeah. thick, about CSS, just to learn CSS, and another book just as thick to learn about um, HTML, and another one to learn about JavaScript. And then, you know, a lot of people use JavaScript frameworks. Uh, I don't know, five books for all the different JavaScript frameworks people might want to use. It's just kind of sad. It's got so complicated. Yeah. At the same time, it does. If, if it benched. Go ahead. No, go on. Go on. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, I, I do understand, though, that, like you said, there's no visual representation of having certain blocks in the sidebar on some pages, but not others. But that's relatively easy with something like temp code. Uh, once you do learn it, there is a greater learning curve than just something point and click. Uh, but I can certainly see the value in keeping the interface simpler. Um, because it does allow for more flexibility overall, even if it doesn't allow for as much flexibility um, for somebody who's not willing to go so in depth. Um, I do completely understand wanting to make it easier for people. I can see both sides of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you use um, one of these site builder tools like Wix, that will make it super easy to edit the layout. And I think it's just point and click. Yeah. I don't know how it works behind the scene. It's, it probably has some way of binding what you do visually back into the style sheets. Um, and because the sites are like ridiculously simple compared to Composer, then it can do that. It's achievable. Mm -hmm. I, I still think that a lot of that could be done in Composer with time if we put in the effort. Mm -hmm. um, but what, one of our users had an idea recently um, when I circulated the um, future direction document around. Uh, one of our users called Soccer Dad, he um, suggested that we, that we can kind of sidestep the problems of block layout by, for most sites, not even really having multiple blocks. We just have like um, a tile based view of um, content. So we just kind of, you, you know, when you use my, um, Windows 10 and you get to the um, tile-based screen, the, the uh, tablet optimized screen. And it, basically everything you've been using recently is a tile and it just puts out all different kinds of content like the, the clock or the calendar or whatever as a standard size tile. Yeah. Um, and you just directly access it. We could do the same with content. So we could have, um, if there's a poll set, we put out a tile for the poll. If um, news entries have been added recently, we put them out as tiles in the order of the news entry. and. Yeah, any kind of content that's been added would just be a tile. Hmm. Uh, and we'd use some kind, not AI, not AI, but some kind of reasonably smart algorithm for determining what tiles to put out and in what order. And um, for most people, that would probably just serve their needs. Because it's just, a, at the end of the day, for most people, they're just trying to publish content. Mm -hmm. And uh, as long as it lays it out in a reasonably intelligent way, uh, they don't need to directly control the ordering of things. So that's something I'd really like to do in version 12, just have a default layout of one block, and that block would be the tile view block. 
that pulls out any content you've set intelligently. Hmm. Of course, then if you we, we've did... always served them. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, if you. Uh... I saw it go on. If you do replace the multi-block structure with a single block that's just dynamically sort of um, generated by an algorithm, and then you did want to go in and customize that, though, um, I mean, depending on what options and what settings you have built into that one block, you might end up at the same place of just needing to customize the code of the block, not unlike you would have to customize the code that's laying out all of your different blocks anyway. Right, so you could just take the block out and you could put in the blocks you'd otherwise have. So okay. it's not really making it any harder. It's just it's just making the default simpler. Okay. Um, it ties into it ties into theming too because I tried at various points to brief professional web designers to make a composer theme, and they can make a really pretty theme, but it's very difficult for designers to think in a um, kind of an abstract component-based uh, way of thinking because for a designer, they've got like a, a canvas and they're laying out things on the canvas. Yeah. But if that canvas depends on what the site owner wants, uh, if, if, it's, if it has different stuff on it or different arrangements, maybe different sets of columns uh, based on a design, to make a theme that can adapt to whatever kind of layout a ultimate webmaster might want. So we could potentially have people making themes that are optimized for the tile layout. Um, and thus, therefore, we can have high quality themes made right. uh, much more easily by professional designers um, that work for the majority of users. Um, so what we're trying to do here is make it so that the average user has a really easy time and they can just pick from 20 really high quality themes when they install the software and it lays everything out for them and they can change a few theme options to you know, may- maybe turn off shadows or um, as Jason said, maybe move the menu or something, maybe change it from a drop down menu to um, a non drop down menu or a uh, um, a menu that uh, just lays it all out. Um, if it's just done as options and the themes just work with the set of options without having to work with a set of open ended open ended template editing and um, uh, panel editing that a user might want to do that it, it makes it much more feasible just to have things out of the box really easy for people mm-hmm. and and be customized. It's just that there, there, there's a distinction between making things customizable and making things open-endedly customizable. I don't think the average user needs, needs things to be completely open-ended. They just need to be able to have something that's unique and um, tuned a little bit to how they want it. Yeah, um, and that's pretty much how, that's pretty much how every other piece of software works. Right. Uh, com- one of Composer's uh, downfalls has always been it's got so many, so much flexibility mm-hmm. that it gives so much rope for people, for people to hang themselves with. Right. So um, uh, we kind of set expectations a bit too high for most people, and I think we want to you know have a, something that just works out of the box, and then people who do want to have the open ended customization. They don't have to work any harder than they currently have to do, um, but it's it's just segmented away from the average user. Hmm. Yeah. So uh, that, along with the change of um, of composer's development model and everything that you're talking about right now, it seems like you're really putting a lot of focus into appealing to the mainstream user who right now might want to go with something much easier like WordPress that you talked about earlier. Uh, because a lot of users don't need yeah. some of the advanced functionality and, like you said, the open-ended um, configurability. Um, yeah, looking to get yeah, more it's, people. It's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's not necessarily a case of whether someone needs something or not either. It's, um, it's often a case of just giving people a good start. Um, in the past, I used to think, like, 
what does someone want from their website if, if they're doing like blue sky thinking what's like the optimal website that they want mm -hmm. and what's the shortest path for them to get to that optimal website and that's kind of the mindset composer is designed with so they they launch they install their site they go through the setup wizard it does the block layout they want then they can start rearranging the blocks a bit or um doing css editing right realistically trying to do the optimal path to get to their perfect site will completely overwhelm the average person. Hmm. I think the average person wants something that meets their basic needs, and then over multiple years, they're going to tune it. So on some weekend, maybe they're, you know, make their panel a bit closer to the perfect panel they want. Make their front page a bit closer to the perfect front page they want. Maybe some weekend they're going to add content. So they're not going to all in one go right. get to the optimal site. Um, so if we can make things really simple out of the box, it's not necessarily saying that this is it, this is all you're going to get. But it's getting things that's... Uh, it's, it's like a halfway house, I guess, um, between like a really simple default that doesn't make too many assumptions and their perfect site that's going to take them too long to make and it's going to overwhelm them. It, it's, a better, it's a better launching off point for the average user, I think, hmm. uh, without compromising anything at all because they still have the full flexibility of the system. Yeah. What you're saying kind of reminds me of the, um, the KDE sort of slogan, uh, beautiful by default, powerful when needed. So you've yeah, got sane yeah, defaults, exactly. but you've still yeah. got all of that configuration under the hood if you do want to go in and, and do that sort of customization. Yeah. The, the same is kind of true for Drupal, uh, to, to more an extreme. One of the Composer kind of uh, has always kind of sit, sat in the middle ground between a programmer's CSS and a CSS for people without many develop without any kind of development skill. Mm -hmm. um, so most people, even nowadays, will pick Drupal or WordPress. WordPress, super simple. Drupal, su super complicated. Right. Um, because we, sit, we because we sit in the middle, it's kind of an uncomfortable place for most people. So whilst I want to keep Composer CMS in the middle in terms of what it can do, I want it to, out of the box, be beautiful and immediately usable, like WordPress, but still be be incredibly customizable, like something like Drupal. Um, most users are really visual. So if they see a default block layout and they don't see, they, maybe they see like um, a pole is sitting next to a, um, a block showing the latest image and they don't have exactly the same height. So there's some white space beneath mm -hmm. the pole maybe. Um, they just think this is a really ugly system, <laughs> and yeah. they, they won't go. They won't make the effort to customize it. So whilst you can make incredibly beautiful sites um, with effort, I, th I think it's in, in other words. I think it's more important to have something that looks beautiful is default than to have something that is. Um, ugly but closer to the optimal customization they want most people want to start beautiful rather than optimize for what they want they might not say it but i think that's <laughs> true because most people are design orientated okay yeah it certainly seemed like that was what um jason was sort of talking about earlier what do you think about that kind of line of thinking Um, Jason and Rajesh <laughs> seem to be flipping between avatar and webcam. I'm not sure what's going on there. It is kind of cool, sir, uh, free continents here. So I'm, I'm yeah, we've Europe, got a, um, certainly a global think, call going on right now. Yeah, yeah. Three of you in America and uh, one in Asia. If we had someone in Africa and someone in, in Australia, mm. that would just be perfect next week maybe hmm. oh, of course we've got to get someone from Antarctica and that's a bit more difficult <laughs> yeah that'll that'll be a little bit harder um, yeah 
anyone else have anything else to discuss this week about Composer, how you're using it? Any questions for Chris? Uh, no questions here. Uh, I just, for what I use uh, Composer for, for my websites, I mm -hmm. like it that it's uh, it's not just a CMS. It's like a, it's a whole framework. I kind of view it like a, like an operating yeah. system. It's kind of like Linux or Windows in that you've got your underlying kernel and kind of the under the hood stuff that deals with the server. And then you've got your mm -hmm. apps and services that run on it. And mm -hmm. you could really just strip Composer down to just the framework and then add everything else that you want on top of it. That's not something that you're stuck with a default. Uh, you can start with the default and kind of pick and choose what you want to keep and what you want to replace. And that's kind of what I do with my mm -hmm. different websites. Yep, yep. So that's that's what the really smart um, user can do with Composer. So we've always targeted multiple audiences. I think we do the CMS for the smart developer better than any other CMS. Um, let, let me let me step back a bit. I, I, I suppose you've got a CMS for uh, like a novice. Then you've got a CMS for someone smart but not necessarily wanting to do hardcore programming. And then you've got a CMS for a programmer. Um, and I think we, we do that um, smart user known programmer thing better than anyone else. I think we do the CMS for a program as well as anyone else, depending on how, on how complicated they want their site to be. But I think it's a novice user that we put need to put in the biggest effort for. Um, because that novice user might end up in that middle tier, but not if they kind of lose interest or get too overwhelmed or run out of time before they can get up to that level. So I think most of our development effort nowadays really has to go into the serving the serving the uh, novice user out of the box really well with something incredibly beautiful with themes out of the box. All right. And we have been going for a couple of hours here. Um, Chris, do you think we need to go much longer or is it about time to wrap things up? Uh, no, no, we can wrap things up, yeah. Um, okay. It's mostly me talking at this point. Um, <laughs> yeah. We'll try and pull more people in next week. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, but I think this went pretty well. Yeah, we we, uh, we wrote some code, we wrote some blocks, we wrote some temp code, and we talked about the future dire uh, direction of Composer. So um, I, 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 this will be up on your YouTube channel, right, for anyone to view. Yep. Um, so may maybe some people will take a look and think, oh, next week, I could have asked some questions, and yeah. uh, Chris would have wrote me some code for free. Wow, he usually charges a hundred dollars an hour to do that. So. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so more people, more people come in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah cool. but maybe now that you publish those documents about the new uh, direction of Composer, if people take a look at those and have more questions about them, we can get some more discussion about that next week as well. Mm-hmm. Cool. Okay, well, yeah, I'm going to dial out then now. So thank you for organizing all this, Jacob. I was planning to do it myself um, back at the kind of beginning of the year, but I just didn't have time. So it's really helpful that you've basically organized the whole thing for us. And all I have to do is talk for two hours. That, that's great. Absolutely. So thank you, thank you very much for doing that. It's, it's a big help for us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so and much. Thank, thank you, Rajesh. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Rajesh, thank for coming along. It's it's uh, like um, one thirty in the morning or something. Yeah, then, no, two twenty, two twenty in the morning. It's two twenty in the morning. Wow. But anyway, it is good and you know, it's informative and a good start. Uh, I'm being a uh, witness for the first time. Maybe uh, probably I will get more questions uh, in coming weeks. But it's good. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Thanks, thanks, guys. I'm dialing out now. So uh, hopefully see you all next week. All right. Bye now. Okay. Bye. So thank you. Oh. All right. Well, that was our first um, our first composer. Let's see. I'll cancel that. That was our first composer weekly meeting. I think I. Oh.
All right. That was our first Composer Weekly meeting. Uh, we're going to be doing those every week. So I did just uh, kind of hang up on the call there. I don't think we were clear on exactly when everyone was hanging up there. This was the first week we did this sort of thing. Um, so, you know, we weren't quite sure what to expect. I don't think any of us quite knew exactly what we were aiming for, but we got a lot of good discussion. Um, so that's what we're doing with these Composer weekly meetings. Um, we didn't really explain at the beginning of the video, but Composer is a content management system. Basically, you install it on a web server and it, it gives you a groundwork to build a website. So you build a website using Composer as your content management system. Um, it's got features all over the place. It's got um, content publishing, it has forums, it has chat room system uh, built into it. It's got permissions, user groups. It has two programming languages and a, uh, a freaking terminal, a web terminal to control your website. It's got so many things um, and I use it for nerdofthestreet.com. I've been using it for years. Um, so I was really excited when Chris approached me about starting these weekly meetings about this. So um, yeah, download Composer. It's at compo.sr and uh, download it, put it on a web server, give it a try. Um, yeah, and then show up next week. I'll definitely tweet out and put on the Facebook page again the next time that we do this. It will probably be the same time next week, uh, but it might change. So keep an eye on that. And yeah, bring questions about Composer. It doesn't matter. You know, you don't have to be a programmer. Like I always say, I'm not a programmer. Even if you're just a user, um, go ahead and try out Composer. Bring your questions. Um, Chris is obviously looking to appeal to novices, so um, novices are certainly welcome to try Composer and let us know what you think. Or if you are a programmer, I know Chris is w wanting to get more developers involved. Definitely, um, no matter what you are, if you're interested at all in web development or in having your own website, give Composer a try and meet us back here next week. Uh, but yeah, for now, this this entire recording will be on the YouTube channel uncut. Not going to edit it this week. I'll see how it goes and see what we're going to do for next week. Um, but yeah, I'll see you all in the call next week. Bye.